you ready to try recording some video? Even if you've purchased your camera to take still photos, it likely has a video recording mode that could be as simple as pressing a red button near the shutter release key. And like photographers, videographers also have a language that describes the technical issues that are important to them. Recording video is nearly the same as recording stills. The primary difference is that the camera continuously records still images, saving those images into a file that's designed to play those images as quickly as they were recorded. And as I said, you can just press the red button. But there are advantages to using your camera's video mode. It often enables access to many video-specific settings which I'm about to explain. <laughs> and on recent models, it also isolates the video and stills mode, which means that the settings for one are independent of the other. Well, let's start with all those continuously recorded images. The term frames per second, often abbreviated FPS, is the setting that determines how many still images are recorded every second. Uh, typical frames per second settings are 24, 30, and 60. I'll explain in a sec. Uh, confusingly, many manufacturers use the term P, so you need to recognize a setting that includes 24, 30, and 60 is the settings for frames per second. Now, confusingly, in some regions it's 25 and 50. Uh, many cameras also or alternately include frame per second options that are just slightly less than the integer, so 23.98 instead of, or in addition to 24, 29.97 representing 30, 59.94 for 60. I'll provide an explanation in a sec. But if you're not interested in the geeky historical detail, use 30 or 29.97. That setting creates videos that are compatible with most modern displays. If your camera has 25 instead of 30, use that, as it provides compatibility with TV sets in your region. So to understand different frame rates, we go back to early movies. Motion picture film was traditionally recorded at 24 frames per second. That's the slowest setting for image and sound to be recording smoothly, before humans start to perceive flickering image or stuttering sound from slower frame rates. And television was traditionally broadcast at 30 frames in many countries because that was an easy multiple of the AC mains frequency of 60 hertz. In countries where the electrical grid is 50 hertz, 25 frames was used. So if your camera provides 25 and 50 frame rates, a setting to change to 30 and 60 may be available. The 30, 60 rates are usually called NTSC, 25, 50 are PAL. Uh, the nature of the display technology used in television sets meant that at 25 frames, flicker was still visible to some viewers. So in the 1970s, most of the countries that broadcast at 25 frames transitioned to 50 frame flicker-free sets. Although it wasn't as much of an issue on 30 frame sets, many TV set manufacturers also added 60 frame. But the nature of display technology in this millennium means that neither are really an issue. 25 or 30 frames is suitable for, for nearly all purposes. And unless you have good reasons to choose an alternate, use 30 frames. And why not exactly 30? Well, when color television was developed, broadcasters and TV set manufacturers wanted to adapt the existing black and white signal so the color broadcast would display properly on a black and white set and that black and white broadcasts would display properly on a color set. So this meant consumers could buy one set that displayed both and saved broadcasters from producing and broadcasting programming in both formats. So to achieve this compatibility, engineers made a very small adjustment to the frame rate using a technique called drop frame. So 30 frames becomes 29.97 to accommodate the color subcarrier. Now, it's a distinction that really only affects video editors. Today, nearly all displays use the 30 frame rate, which is why I recommend that as your first choice. And why P instead of FPS? It stands for progressive, signifying that each frame is a complete frame, 
Back in the days of analog broadcast TV, the signal was interlaced. Alternating frames had odd or even scan lines or only half the image. That was I. But it's been obsolete for several decades. P replaced I, but somehow it remains attached to the frame rate number. Well, many believe that recording 24 frames provides a more cinematic look. Hogwash. As nearly all TV sets and computer monitors refresh at 30 frames, or a multiple of that, when you watch a 24-frame recording, the display interpolates the missing six frames every second by displaying some frames a second time. So unless that's an effect you're going for, use 30. A cinematic look is created with lighting, and by using an appropriate shutter duration, which is the most important video setting. For 30 frame recordings, the shutter duration should be 1 60th. Now you're right, that seems slow. And if there's movement, there will be blurring. Because each image is a still, that blur helps to provide the illusion of movement. Using a shorter shutter duration will provide crystal clear and sharp images if you look at them one at a time. But if they're viewed continuously, the lack of blur makes motion look stilted and jumpy. Many of you are probably thinking that a shutter duration like 1 60th is limiting or even impossible on bright sunny days. Even with the aperture close to its smallest and the ISO set at its lowest, you might still be overexposing the sky. And that's why your number one video accessory is an ND filter three to six stops should do it. A few cameras have built-in ND. Now, many cameras offer frame rates faster than 60, with or without audio, and these are useful for slow motion effects. For instance, if you record at 120 frames and play at 25% of the original speed, you'll still have one recorded frame for each playback frame. And for those higher frame rates, the camera will often limit the available shutter durations to ones that are shorter than the frame rate. For 120 frames, the longest shutter duration may be 1 over 125. Now, most cameras offer both 4K and HD resolutions. And although it often seems like HD, with a resolution of 1920 pixels by 1080 pixels, is obsolete, it does provide a high quality image. That's a ratio of 16 units wide by nine units high, and it's the standard aspect ratio of HD and 4K TV sets. 4K uses the same aspect ratio, but doubles both resolutions, so there it's 3840 by 2160, recording four times as many pixels. However, it's interesting to note that 4K is still only 8 megapixels compared to stills, much less than the resolution of your still images. Now, obviously, 4K is more detailed, but not all viewers appreciate the additional resolution, not in video anyway, not on YouTube either. But there is an advantage to recording in 4K, even if your final video will be produced in HD. With a 4K recording, you can zoom and crop the image to one quarter of the original size while editing, and still have a full resolution HD image. That can be useful. And although all of your screens are likely designed for 16x9 video, Movies are usually produced using the slightly wider cinematic 17 by 9 aspect ratio. That's a resolution of 4096 by 2160 pixels, usually called DCI 4K. Your 16 by 9 display shrinks the image slightly, about 70%, making those 4096 pixels fit into the available 3840, leaving a black bar above and below. So, like 24 frames, DCI 4K is a cinema purist setting that reduces quality when reviewed on a standard TV or other display. Some cameras offer options for the recording format or codec. Don't worry if it doesn't. That selection defines the file type and controls the compression applied to the image as the video is being recorded. Recording uncompressed video is beyond the capability of consumer cameras. So some Sony cameras offer XAVCS and AVCHD. The newer XAVCS will offer more capabilities and better quality. 
And when selecting a file setting, don't let the extension M4V, MOV, or MP4 distract you. They are different, but not in any way that's important to you. To any video player on your computer, phone, or TV set, they are essentially identical. You may feel free to change the extension from one to another if it pleases you. Although it's not usually specified, most cameras encode video using the MPEG-4 H.264 codec, a compression standard first developed by Apple about 2001. A new standard has been implemented on some recent cameras, H.265, also called HEVC, the High Efficiency Video Codec. Although it's not yet as compatible as H.264, it's better. Mostly because file sizes are smaller, but also because it can be higher quality. And the best way to ensure quality is to use the highest available bit rate. That's usually expressed in M bits, sometimes shortened to M. In 2021, 100 is about the minimum. I found 400 to be overkill for YouTube, so I mostly use 200 if it's available. Uh, video settings may have limitations and exclusions based on frame rate or resolution. And you may encounter other options like All Intra or Long Gop. All Intra is more suitable for editing because more information is saved with each frame. Long Gop is more efficient and more suitable for playback. Whatever. There's a nearly endless variety of options available on some models. Please post your questions below and I'll do my best to clear them up. Well, in video mode, your camera may operate differently than stills. Many cameras force focus to continuous when recording video, and focus features like eye detect may not work or not work as well. It can be very distracting if the camera loses or changes focus while you're recording video. And if your camera's continuous focus doesn't work well in video mode, try manual focus. When the distance from the camera to the subject isn't changing, that provides more reliable results. And then white balance. Auto white balance is great for stills, but not video. Even a small shift during a scene can make it impossible to edit. Using one of your camera's white balance presets, or better yet, capture a custom white balance for your scene. Sound may be an afterthought to you, but it's crucial to high quality video. Audio recorded in the video file is usually at the standard CD quality setting, which is good. Some manufacturers like Nikon offer a choice. Audio encoding is the only difference between Nikon's MOV and MP4. If you have a choice, linear PCM is slightly better than AAC. However, if audio is important to you, record externally on a dedicated audio recorder, using the right microphone for the task. Although onboard mics and recording capability may be suitable to use as ambience or background, it's not high quality. And videographers like to talk about log. <laughs> well, here's an explanation for novices. Log is short for logarithmic, which simply means curved instead of a straight line. Log curves modify the range of light that can be recorded. Each brand has their own version, Sony's S-Log, Nikon's N-Log, Fujifilm's F-Log. Log recordings provide a larger range of brightness values combined with flat or muted color. The log recording compresses the midtones, creating a less contrasty image, that enables the camera to capture a wider light range from dark shadows to bright sun. A log recording isn't designed for final viewing. The expectation is that the log footage will be refined during editing using a process called color grading to create the final image. Many editors and colorists start with a preset adjustment using a lookup table, often called a LUT, modifying the recording to a more natural look and then further color adjustments are made, setting the mood of the scene. It's complicated. <laughs> Don't start recording in log format until you've created some samples and evaluated the entire process to make sure it's suitable for your creative intent. Uh, there are many advanced topics for video producers. 
using your camera's HDMI output and recording on external video recorders, and settings like stabilization, zebra, and timecode, as well as accessories like tripods and gimbals. <laughs> Let's leave those for now. As I said earlier, please post your relevant questions and civil comments below. I do read and reply, and as I indicated at the beginning, I'm not sponsored, so I don't stop in the middle to promote some product or service, and nor do I allow YouTube to interrupt my videos with mid-roll ads. So those decisions make this a better channel for you, but they do have a financial impact, so I'm very grateful to those of you who decided to support this channel by becoming a member. If membership is for you, please use the join button below, but subscribers need not worry. No content will be behind a paywall. So thank you for watching today. Stay safe.